my side. Thank you, Susanne, for the nice introduction. And first of all, thanks Hans and his amazing team for the stage, um, for me and Bernhard to speak about a multi-stakeholder dialogue, a key tool for building sustainable ventures across nations. So it's about innovation and it's about new ways of mobility, but first of all, it's about smart people coming together and thinking about um, solutions, solutions to different and, and complex topics. Before Bernhard is going to show you an example of multi-stakeholder dialogue in action, let me start by asking two crucial questions. First, what world are we living in? And second, are there any preconditions for successful multi-stakeholder dialogue? For the first question, it's uh, no secret that we're living in a complex, multipolar world with different power blocks competing with each other on a systemic level, in the economic, political, and also social sphere. This can be seen every day in so-called war, uh, so war of narratives, where those centers try to influence each other and fight for attention using state-of-the-art technology. So that is the status quo. The systemic competition is in full fledge and will only increase in the years to come with unprecedented consequences for international supply chain and therefore also for economic and political cooperation, as well for, for cooperation in the soft power fields, which is culture, sports, education, and so on. I have a question now. Does anyone know how many people already live in autocracies? I tell you, 70%. So that means we as the West are already loosening, but I think it would be a mistake to conclude from this fact that autocracies are the more efficient system to handle great challenges such as pandemics um, or climate change, etc. I think quite the opposite. Working closely with executives from autocratic countries myself, I'm a firm believer in the qualities and advantages of liberal democracies and a free market economy, as I think, although having its flaws, it's the best system for the individual citizen in the long run. The number I just showed you is a reality. We have to be aware of it and we have to deal with it by showing our standpoint and values as Europe, but also listen closely to our international partners and their perspectives. Because one thing is for sure, addressing today's most pressing problems with a power politics mindset is 21st century thinking and highly outdated. In fact, it's cynical. Considering that global problems like the consequences of man-made climate change or economic shocks triggered by pandemics and wars cannot be solved by any single country or any block of countries. My colleague um, Ian Bremer, a social scientist like myself, once called it a G-zero world meaning in order to solve these problems, we have to work together in multilateral setups, trying to bring all relevant stakeholders to the table. And the best instrument are multi-stakeholder dialogue. And that brings us to the second question. Are there preconditions for such dialogue? And why is it so hard actually to align all these different interests? To begin with, it's crucial to have a common understanding about the problem at hand, so the definition. We first have to recognize and acknowledge the problem, and then we have to ask who would win and who would lose from a certain problem-solving mechanism or solution. What certainly also helps is to remember what is at risk. Innovation understood as solving pro a problem in a more sustainable way than the existing solution or technology often depends on a simple question, and this is, is the pressure high enough. If it is, that would be the moment party politics could be overcome on a national level and on a global level negotiations would be addressed in a more social and common way and less driven by national interest. A further, maybe the most important factor is the ability to listen. Try to understand the other parties on the table. Where do they come from? Where do you want to go? What are their aims, ambitions, needs, fears, interests? Finally, is there common ground for a win-win outcome? Or rather, the winner, or let's say the more, most powerful party on the table takes it all. Another factor is culture. 
That means unwritten codes of conduct and procedures to solve problems. A basic distinction would be a Western individual mindset versus an Eastern approach where the society at large plays a greater role and problems aren't addressed directly but in a more face-saving way. So considering these factors, non-exclusive factors, I have to add, is a beginning for a successful multi-stakeholder dialogue. At this point, I can't go in much further details, but I would like to mention a few points how to set the stage for such dialogue. First of all, it's about the successful curation of topics and people. So I would say it's kind of like being the bouncer in a nightclub, just making sure that the right people are part of the party. And of course, the surrounding is important, meaning creating an inspirational atmosphere where people have space and room to think freely. I would also recommend always to limit it to a small group, exclusive group of people. For all said, bear in mind, leaders often react to problems rather than proactively work on sustainable solutions based on a clear strategy and scenario planning. But still, it is possible to have visions, even as a politician. Finally, I would like to highlight the process of constant communication and coordination between the different stakeholders. Therefore, it needs a COO or someone who works as a translator of different interests and working cultures at the table. So this person needs to have a holistic view, a macro perspective at the different parties involved trying to moderate the process. Besides me, in such a person is Bernhard, who will tell you now what it actually means to build new IPs across nations trying to find a strategic fit. So that's for me. And Bernhard, I would like to give the word to you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. So, hi, how are you? Ten minutes to go. It's a really complex thing what I need to present now. And uh, let's move it on. So this is what we're talking to Dubai. Uh, so I'm living in Abu Dhabi since 11 years. I worked for Etihad Aviation for the airlines. And uh, since two years, I'm leading this program, Two Nations program. What are we doing? You see Kanzler Merkel and Sheikh Mohammed. Sheikh Mohammed is today the president of the UAE. And they kicked off a program in 2019 to be sustainable with technology 4.0. At that time, seven different pillars of different companies found together, talked together, and at the end, developed projects. This is a story with ministers open in Aachen at the university, RWTH Aachen University, and on the right side with ministers and German ministers. You need to understand the German Emirate Institute, what, what we're driving here at the moment, it's like an investment company. So we're looking on projects, we're bringing partners together, and at the, we make it happen. So here you see it again, identify, combine, and bring in investments in projects. At the end, we're talking with governments, purely at the moment too, but currently also going up to eight different countries. Very interesting. And what we're doing, we also bring it up to more or less on private in interest. So what we have done so far, 56 million funding in uh, three big projects. Uh, the first one, recycling of aircraft, which we're doing with BASF, which we're doing with Safran, which we're doing a lot of with other companies. This material is going back into 3D printing. So Recycling means also bringing thing, things back in 3D printing later on to put it on aircraft. Second one, intelligent cabin, dispatching an aircraft much more faster. Uh, we're doing that with Boeing and Airbus. This is the only project, industry project with Boeing and Airbus together. And the last one, synthetic fuel. This is very tricky. As I let uh, Idiot, uh, I talked with Lufthansa to release 20, 26,000 liters in 2026 for a dollar price for 6.5. This will be the first synthetic fuel what we deliver from Abu Dhabi through a refinery in Germany. This is the so-called big volume project. So we have uh, partially released all this budget, about 690 million. Uh, we're looking on the synthetic fuel. You heard about a lot of discussions about refinery at the end. We converted from methanol into purely synthetic fuel, going with a blending to 20% on jet aircraft and 100% at the end also on automotive. Second one, organic food. 
And the third one is what I want to talk a little bit in detail, decarbonization for mobile interiors. So what means decarbonization factor of mobile interiors? This is the story how it's running in, in Germany just now. Eight billion euros are released to go going red, get rid from, uh, from fossils at the end to bring new technologies on board and bringing jobs on board. And you heard about Northern Westphalia, Saxonia, uh, Saxonia Anhalt as well, also Brandenburg, they release that money and UAE manner is well connected here. The solution, what we're doing here, is so-called mobile interior. So here is Airbus, Boeing as well, BMW, Toyota. We have also from Yachts, we have Deutsche Bahn on board. They're doing with us a common approach to produce mobile interior in the future. This is going in a model factory. We talked about it needs to be emission-free. And this emission-free is 80% more than facts that at the end it will be emission-free. Unfortunately, we have a gap of 20%, so we need to do future synthetic fuel. You saw that already, and I show it here. The electricity is coming from the UAE. Solar power is coming from the UAE. Carbon will be feeded inside. Methanol is coming out. Going on ships, MIN is our partner. Four ships are already more or less manufacturers. They're driving pure with methanol, and then we bring it to a refinery to be developed in Germany. There is a selected refiner we cannot talk about, but it's a near east, far east, we call it sometimes, in Germany. That is what we're doing here. I said we common, make a common approach of develop mobile interior. So what was the interesting point? Airbus and Boeing talked with automotive people, and they said, hey, we have the same material. We need to certify it more complex. And automotive said, we don't need that, but we, we were interested that to common develop and common design. You see nine boxes, and you see a little bit, this is 3D printing. So the idea is get rid of emission means no tooling anymore, develop at the end, and produce 3D printed parts in automotive, in aircraft, in yachts, in space, even Airbus space is here on, and even on railway. In a summary, we talk about green technology, we talk about smart production, that's it for the future. Get rid of all these emissions, what we want to have in the future. And I need to say, either living in Abu Dhabi, as I'm working partially also for the UAE government, it's a really exciting story just now. We're pushing, for sure, a lot of money in this, in this new technologies, but we have also smart companies, small companies, which added on, so not only the big ones. At the end, you see this is a consortium on the, on the Decap factory, Airbus, Boeing, Siemens, Bosch, all of them, 30, uh, 30, 30 of these partners from 41, they're investing inside. And you see where they're coming from. We are really proud on Boeing and Teague. We are proud on Toyota. Teague, especially, you know this design company, they designed the Dragon Capsule, the interior Dragon Capsule from Elon Musk. We have here again an, an overview of all the companies parting. And at the end, what's really important, this is the whole project in sum. You see on the right side the German Emirate Institute. It's investment, but on the other side, it's IP. So you can imagine the Middle East don't want to buy any more technology. They want to own technologies. They want to transfer technologies. And the German Emirate Institute hold the IPs and bring these IPs to those they need this once for sure it's investment. Here the decap factory, you see different production steps, you see surface treat and assembly, and this is purely 3D printing. In certain areas we cannot do 3D printing, we have also some of the traditional manufacturing, but you see the project partner underneath, these are the partners are working together, not separately in silo, and what we're doing, we need to create products. These are the four product streams. You can see when they can work together, then they can also save money. At the end, what we're doing, we really add current research projects funded by German government, funded by the UAE government in this Deca factory. You see iCabin, for example, Metajet is included inside. So this will be the whole overview of the Deca factory. Then, how it's financed, very important. So 330 companies doing investment commitments. 
30% from the fundings up to 50%. At the moment, we discuss between different uh, uh, states here. Very hot uh, discussion just currently with Northern Westphalia and Brandenburg. And 40% is private and government fund from UIE and Germany on, the, on a collaboration. Uh, here again, the overview and here the cost, 250 million. And we start with a so-called think tank with seven of these uh, founders. Uh, there will be seven founders to build also as GmbH, starting this kick off and develop, but also to produce and manufacture this factory at the end. This is a jobs. We want to create 2,000 jobs, completely different, with new job profiles, digital jobs, nothing to do with traditional jobs anymore, bringing people from coal, bringing people from oil, into new jobs, retaining education, you see, and here an overview of new job profiles in the future. Again here, this is my last slide. These are the five competitors what we talk at the moment, so three in Northern Westphalia and uh, two in, uh, in East Germany. That's it from my side. I got it. Two minutes still to go. <laughs> You speed it up at the end, Renner. Thank you very much, Jeremy. It's also thank you very much. Join us in the middle because, first of all, of course, I'm going to check with the audience if there are any questions from your side, guys. No. Then I'm going to ask the one question I obviously ask everybody on stage: <laughs> Is there at least anything good about the competition between power blocks, and how does that influence the multi-stakeholder dialogue? Yeah, I mean, I would say... I was talking about competition, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. no, I think competition is something good. And I think, it Bernard, is. you would agree, um, especially when we talk about climate change, maybe also on a systemic level, if different power blocks come up with more innovative solutions and try to compete also, in a, they can work together in a multilateral setup. And I think that's what you're also trying to do, starting on a bilateral level. But having, as you showed, all these different partners involved, be it um, the, the top um, universities in Germany and, and the UAE, or big industry players, but also startups. Bernhard, right? Yeah, this is a point. Uh, so as I worked uh, uh, now over 10 years in, in the UAE, I can tell you the following. When I went in front of board people, uh, local people, board people, it was not possible to give them a complete presentation of 10 slides. You need to bring it up to one slide. So this culture is different. Our culture is different, and to work together is different. So at the end, we worked with 58 nationalities. This is a lot and a huge story, but when you understand your partner from the other side and understand the other side as well, then it works for the whole world. I can you tell it. This is not a totalitarian uh, government there. I need to say that, very open, but they fear more or less that they have not oil enough in the 50, 60, 70 years old. And they do it very well. At the moment, they push, uh, I cannot say how much, billions they push in new technologies. And probably you look a little bit carefully in different companies, even here. So they put their shares inside. And what we're doing, we want to accelerate more to that technology transfer. That's what is the first one. And the second one also to work together in a common way. Perfect. That was the best conclusion I could wish for. <laughs> Wonderful. Then, Bernard, yeah. Jeremy, thank you very much. Obviously, we don't have any questions okay. anymore. Then this is your round of applause. Thank you. Thanks Bye. a lot.